Hello, and welcome to the Kirov International Music Festival podcast series. Our guest today is celebrated baritone Anton Belov. The voice of baritone Anton Belov has been called rich and mellifluous by the New York Times, while the Philadelphia Inquirer described him as an emerging star. His recent appearance as the soloist in Carmen Aburana was described by Florida Weekly as captivating in every way, casting a mystical spell over the audience. He earned praise from critics and audiences alike for his portrayals of Enrico, Om Lucia di La Marmur, Don Giovanni, Germant from La Traviata, Count de Luna, Eugene Onegin, Escamillo, and many other roles. Mr. Belov performed throughout the United States, appearing with Boston Lyric Opera, Portland Opera, Opera Boston, Opera Delaware, Connecticut Grand Opera, and other companies, as well as with the Boston Baroque Opera Orchestra of New York, the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, Las Vegas Philharmonic, California Symphony, Rhode Island Philharmonic, Colorado Symphony, and many, many, many other orchestras. Mr. Belov is also first place winner of eight international local competitions and um, a most accomplished artist for whom no introduction will do complete justice. Uh, Mr. Belov, would you like to introduce yourself and add to what I, I said already? You have so many diverse... Uh, I don't know what else to say. You read my bio so beautifully. I've been writing it out over so many years, so it's kind of funny to uh, hear it read out loud, you know. It, it feels very narcissistic to be hearing it, so rather not add anything oh, no, 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 not at all. No, in fact, I feel always very self-conscious, you know, when I, and I, I feel I'm not doing it justice because I'm reading quickly through accomplishments, each of which took uh, perhaps months or years to happen, uh, to prepare for, and was a huge milestone in, in your career and a, a wonderful occasion to celebrate for the audiences. Okay. So, um, but um, tell us a little about your musical journey. And uh, if I am not mistaken, you were born in Russia and then you ended up yes. in the United States. I was born in Moscow. I left on the day of the coup, 1991. I actually got my visa on the very day of the coup. I was 16 years old. That was a lot of fun. The tanks were on the streets. Uh, I left two or three days later or something like that. The story actually is kind of convoluted. My dad was dying of cancer. We came to U.S. for, yeah, leukemia. So we came to U.S. for medical treatment. Long story how that all happened. Just lucky accidents, basically. And at the end of the day, he died within two months, and I ended up staying. And I've been here ever since. Um, I st never studied voice in Russia. I never studied voice there. Again, I was 16 years old. Again, by a great accident, I met a amazingly celebrated uh, Russian voice teacher. His name was uh, Simeon Tregubov. Simeon Tregubov, and um, I was 17 or something, and he said, you have good voice, you come to my studio five days a week, you need to pay me nothing, you just come, and I will teach you for free. And, you know, he went to Moscow Conservatory in 1936 or something like that. You know, he was born wow. in 1912. Yeah, he was uh, from that generation. And um, uh, he taught at Gitis, you know, the, the state school of um, theater, and taught many not necessarily opera singers, but actually Russian musical theater singers and wow. uh, Russian actors for whom singing was actually was an auxiliary thing. It was something incidental that they took. Uh, but his training was purely classical, and he sang Eugene Onegin. 96 performances in one season, he told me he sang Eugene Onegin. You know, it was the role that he knew. <laughs> forward, backward, and upside down. So he really taught me the love of singing. And he taught me very much that Russian way, you know, you come in and study for five days a week. That's how it is. And I remember coming back to him after I, I enrolled in New England Conservatory in Boston. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said, Anton, tell me, how many lessons a week do you have? I have I said, well, one, that's standard in this country. Said, one lesson, what kind of a school is that? It's a conservatory. Conservatory? Nobody can teach voice like that. In my country, we teach four lessons a week with each student, plus a coaching. So you spend five hours a week with your teacher. Wow. 
That's um, that's that was standard training during his time, you know. So he you he had if I don't know, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you just put all the yeah. conservatives to shame, you know, all the conservatives to shame. Well, th that was Moscow conservator, obviously. That's where he came from, you know. Right. But I don't know how things are nowadays. I just I have no idea, you know. I haven't been back in many, many years. America is my home. You know? Right. So yeah, uh, uh, so I ended up at New England Conservatory, then Juilliard. I did my master's at Juilliard, an artist diploma. I was very lucky to uh, study with Nico Castell, very famous translator and uh, coach Nico Castell. Well, also tenor, of course, sang at Metropolitan mm -hmm. Opera for decades. Um, and he wrote all these amazing books of translations and transcriptions of uh, of operas, uh, entire Mozart operas, entire Verdi, entire Puccini, mm -hmm. published all these amazing transcriptions. And he said, hey, Bella, you're good at phonetics. You should do the Russian volume. I said, me? I'm just a graduate student. I says, no, no, you understand this. You should do this. So I ended up writing the big fat book of 600 pages of translations of all these great Russian operas that is now used all over this country. And that's really helped me tremendously in my career and just uh, as a scholar, you know, because now mm. it's... Russian well, opera I want to, I want to ask you, what, what was your doctorate all about at the Boston University? Uh, well, doctorate, my doctorate was a performance doctorate. So I actually did not get, I don't have a PhD, I have a DMA, which is Doctorate of Musical Arts rather than PhD. And, you know, PhD is usually a dissertation and DMA is more performance. I had to do five recitals. That was my doctorate project. Five you know, the interesting thing is I did my did my DMA at Juilliard, but uh, man, oh. it, was, it was a PhD level mm -hmm. document. I wrote a few hundred page yeah, essentially a book on on ligatus piano music, but yeah. Wow! Yeah. Oh my gosh! No, I did not have to write a huge document. I just had to do five recitals, and I had to do uh, substantial recital notes. And probably, if you take those notes, that would be like hundred pages of material or something. But it's not. It wasn't a dissertation that I had to defend. Basically, recitals were considered to be part hmm. of my performance doctor. That's the way Boston University did things. So, did you also have to give like lecture recitals? Yes, where... I had to do a lecture recital. My lecture recital was an exoticism in Russian art song, which was a lot of fun to do. On the augmented second in Russian art song, if you know what I'm talking about, that Persian scale. Da, 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 uh, Rimsky Korsakov and the Mighty Five, right. and then going Orientalism, through. Oriental, that's know, right, flavor exactly. All these mm. romances and was really beautiful and analysis. Glazunov's most my favorite song of that genre would be probably Glazunov's Krabi uh, Garita mm. Gonjulani, which was also set by Glinka, it's Pushkin's text. But Glazunov's oh. and Glinka's are two entirely different arrangements. Glinka's is a little bel canto dance, you know. And Glazunov is. So fascinating um, influences of. Um, absolutely. 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 Yeah. Um, you know, I wanted to just return back to what you said earlier about one tiny. I mean, you. You just passed uh, over it, um, but it must have been such such a difficult and painful time for you when your father was sick and you had to come, and it just it just must have made everything much more difficult. The journey to the United oh, States yes. it, it was traumatic and dramatic, and you know it was an absolutely crazy experience. Uh, to, to give you a little bit more background, my mother. Okay, this is kind of a bizarre story. My mother was a puppeteer. She was a oh, that's, that's wonderful. Yes, she was a puppeteer and she came to US on a cultural exchange visa mm -hmm. in 1991 and she knew that her husband was dying of leukemia so she immediately tried to get him medical treatment and as a gesture of goodwill they sent him an invitation and it took Soviet bureaucrats about six months to get us visas and I had to spend six months with my dying father and then finally, I was able to get us both visas. I was 16 years old when I went to American embassy. I had no idea what to say. And they were completely terrified because it was uh, August 19th, 1991. 
<laughs> Whenever I tell the story, people think I'm making this up. I'm not making this up. It really is what happened. And you're, I mean, I mean, I mean, you're laughing about this, and I guess from a distance, I mean, there, there are certain aspects that can be paradoxical or comical. Yeah. But yeah. back in the day, I'm, I'm, I, I can only begin to imagine how you must have felt, you know, with this responsibility. And one has to just grow overnight, just mature overnight. Yeah, kind of had to, kind of had to, you know. And and honestly, this funny funny thing. I have a doctorate degree. I don't have a high school degree. <laughs> I have a GED, you know, a general equivalency diploma. I never finished high school. I, and oh. I started I started college a little bit later than everybody else. I started college at twenty one. Mm -hmm. I lived life for a few years before that and then I learned how to be very much a blue collar worker. I worked at the farm for a couple of years. I made wow. handmade furniture in, uh, in Vermont at the shop in Vermont. I wow. still right now in my house half of the furniture is made by me because I, it's what I do. I like to wow. make furniture by hand. And, well, my deepest uh, respect and you know you know it's just you. Um, you're such an endless, rich source of um, just human experience, and really, you lived a very rich life so far in in every every aspect. And um, you know, even difficult experiences, I learned it from my own my own with my own uh, skin. That you know, tough experiences, difficult experiences in life, they if we survive them, they, they enrich us. Oh, absolutely! Like, I'd love to know more about your journey. Would love to know. That's going to be next podcast, but this podcast is all be, about... You must be from the Baltic states, but I don't know where you're from exactly. Lithuania. I was born in Lithuania. Lithuania. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but then I remember those times, and I remember, you know, watching on the TV with my parents, you know, the August 19th, 1991, and um, mm -hmm. everything that was happening. And we know some events happened in Lithuania, too, when we were separating from the Soviet Union. I think Lithuania was the first um, Soviet Union bloc country that, right. that split and it was just crazy times. But um, I was there right right before that happened. I was there at the flower festival. What is that beautiful flower festival? What is it called? I forgot. It's a beautiful flower festival in Lithuania. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. I, 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 I will look it up. I know, I know it's there, but you know, I you know just, what I'm just, talking just, about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I do. Um, now, let me ask you, so you had, you know, obviously very distinguished, very diversified performing career, you know, performing as a soloist, also performing with different operas, and you must have taught a, a good deal yeah. all over the place. Do you have like a teaching philosophy? Like how do you approach teaching? How do you approach a student who comes to you and says, well, you know, I think I'm the next, you know, Pavarotti and I want to sing. Like, okay. Yeah, so as far as teaching, I've been teaching in academia for 16, 17 years now. I was an adjunct for six years after I got my doctorate. I got my current position. I'm an associate professor of music at Linfield University in uh, Oregon. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it's it's quite a journey. For one thing, obviously, realism. A healthy dose of realism, what you're just saying, is um, very important. As far as purely teaching voice... Um, one of the biggest realizations for me is what one of my first college teachers told, taught me. Says, there are plenty of great voices. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of marvelous, marvelous, marvelous voices. But voice alone is not enough. It has to be a full package. You have to be a great musician. You have to be an interpreter. You have to have the right personality. Mm -hmm. Voice is only one of the ingredients of what makes mm. an artist or what makes an opera singer. And also as far as realism, I I mean, we don't know where this industry is going to go after COVID. We have no idea how this whole behemoth of performing arts, how it's going to exist. We just don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, it's very similar to playing an MBA. Mm. It's very hard to make it anywhere you are. Hmm. It also depends on the voice type. It depends on many, many things. And frankly, this is a brave new world. After COVID, I have no idea how this industry is going to transform. Right. 
I have no idea how much of it is going to become remote, how all these companies are going to be auditioning again. Are they going to be uh, putting on shows the way they used to? Who survived? Who hasn't survived? I'm sure there are plenty of casualties. I mean, I myself now run a summer festival. And one of the reasons why I'm able to participate in Kira program is because I had to cancel two seasons. We canceled 2020. And we canceled 2021, except for one thing. We're doing winery concerts. We live in the, uh, in the middle of wine country here in Oregon. It's mm-hmm. 500 wineries around us. So um, I, I brought my best friends, Oleg Timofeyev, who is a marvelous seven-string guitarist, mm-hmm. and Ian Pomerantz, who's a specialist in Sephardic and Ashkenazi music. Mm-hmm. And we are doing a program of Russian, Romani, and Jewish romances. And we actually have a performance tonight. Our performance tonight, our first public appearance in a year and a half. We only have 30 people. That must be so exciting for many reasons. Yes, absolutely. In fact, we are broadcasting it, live broadcast. I'm going to put it in the chat if you want to share it, how you can listen to it on Facebook tonight at 6.30 our time, 9.30 your time. Yeah, we will absolutely share this. But, uh, but um, well, um, it's very, very exciting. You know, please uh, let us know how it goes. I mean, and um, as I said, no, we will share the link. And I, I, I have hopes that much of uh, performing arts will come back, bounce back. I think that people must miss live concerts, oh, interaction. You know. And I tell you an example. We, it's a very small scale what we're doing right now. But we sold out five concerts in a row. There's not a tick left anywhere. It's all gone. Why? Well, because people are hungry. Everybody's hungry to go and socialize and be with others. And hopefully with vaccination rates the way they are and the COVID mm. numbers are going way down, hopefully it's safe and wonderful. And we are kind of excited. Well, let me ask you some quick questions. So do you, have you ever had an impossible student? Oh, <laughs> yes. Many. And that's actually one of the examples that I was going to say that there is this thing of many great voices. In fact, very often it's the students with the best voices who Mm -hmm. are not musicians, who can't memorize their stuff, who have no work ethic, Mm -hmm. who have um, other personality issues or traits that simply prevent them from becoming professional musicians. That happens. Over and over and over. And it's okay. That's not for everyone. This is not... This life is definitely not for everyone. This is really difficult. Right. There are plenty of other things. There is this notion that musicians, you know, uh, artists in general, they just go by inspiration, largely. There is this popular, you know, belief. Mm. But I would say that uh, artists, musicians are among the hardest working people. Would you agree? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the hardest thing. It's very difficult. Very, very difficult. And perseverance and work. I think, you know, that's it's maybe very cultural. In America, we think that talent is what makes you a great artist. When most other countries it, I think it's mostly perseverance. Talent is just one of the ingredients. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you completely. Well, do you have any Funny stories, you no know, happening. I remember reading, you know, Shalap and many other great, you know, singers and musicians. Just you know, the anecdotal stories and you know things that happen on the stage. I mean, it's funny how you can be most inspired on the stage, for example, and yet um, something as trivial as life around you happening can uh, make a funny mix together. Do you have any funny stories to share with oh, us? I have so many funny stories, and many of them have to do with Russian and singing in Russian with American singers. It's it's wonderful. The things okay. that can happen. The things that can happen. Some of them are a little bit PG-13. Okay. All right. P- tiny okay. bit 13. This one, for example, for some reason, Americans have a very hard time pronouncing S-T-R. S-T-R. Like, you know what I mean? In Russian. Str, str, str. Str, str, str. And in Eugene Onegin... It happened again and again to me that American singers cannot pronounce the T in S-T-R. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know that scene, the duel scene, where um, Zaretsky says, no, все же это странно, мне немножко. 
Okay, okay, now those who know Russians are grinning right now because it's it's a little bit PG-13. The problem is if you don't pronounce the T, the word strange turns into the word poop. And uh, <laughs> that happens over and over on stage to me. In that scene, I cannot tell you how many times I heard Eugene Onegin and and I'm not going to say it because you'll have to bleep me out. And I tell you, Russians are always dying when that happens on stage. So that's one of the examples. Um, what else can I tell you? Funny. Oh, my gosh. Funny things on stage. Oh, I, I have I have a great one. All right. I was doing, I was doing Eugene, uh, not Eugene, Don Giovanni. And I was mm-hmm. singing. You know, champagne areas. Mm. And suddenly, suddenly, a bat flies on stage and starts circling oh. around the stage and flies directly into my face. And I was like, this bat flew from a different opera. Must be a visitor from the Freedom House. <laughs> I don't know what else, any other funny stories about opera. I mean, oh. yeah. That's 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 quite something. I mean, were the audience, the other performers, scared of the bat? What oh yes, to- Zerlina, poor Zerlina runs on stage, terrified, shaking. There's a bat that's flying in my face. I don't know what to do. Yes. Um, I have a story. I have to save it for for the future. And again, when I, maybe I'll do a podcast with myself about oh, a cat and uh, Emil Gillel is playing on the stage and you know cat walking across the stage. Oh, and make it's it's home during a concert now, but 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 um, anyway, so um, let me ask you also so you did so many roles, you performed so many roles in operas. Which role would you say was the most challenging, the most complex, the most difficult? Mm. You know, this is an easy answer, I think, mm. and uh, I think it's the easiest and the hardest role at the same time, and that's Eugene Onegin. I tell you why. When Verdi writes Con Fuoco, you know, with fire, or um, uh, Con Violenza, you know, with violence, mm-hmm. we know what he means. Mm. When you're singing, I don't know, Count de Luna, or you're singing a Count and uh, Marriage of Figaro, and there's anger, that's easy. Mm-hmm. It's easy to express. Eugene Onegin is such an amorphous character when because he is not evil and he's not mm-hmm. positive he is often bored you know what i mean there's so much psychological intricacy that you have to play and opera bores psychological intricacies opera generally prefers emotions that are much more out there you know much more forward so when uh, Tchaikovsky writes at the beginning of Eugene's arias, достоинством покойно и несколько холодно, which means with dignity, with dignity, at peace, and somewhat detached. That is very difficult to put together. That's why Stanislavski, you know, the great Russian theater theorist, uh, Stanislavski has many chapters on Eugene Onegin because it's so difficult to interpret and to make it um and to make it work yeah, it, and it sounds pretty it sounds yeah. pretty elusive it's pretty elusive and um yeah certainly it's, it's a very very challenging role and you know technically mm-hmm. speaking there are plenty of challenges there too no technically honestly it's not that difficult Eugene mm-hmm. Onegin, as far as singing for a baritone, we love singing that role because, you know, the first act, you just have that aria, okay, you're done. Second act, act, okay, you have the duet, you have a little bit of a fight scene. And then third act, you have another aria, the ball scene, and that duet, that duet, you suddenly sing in Verdi, you know, suddenly massive, big, real, dramatic baritone singing, you know. But mm-hmm. overall, you're never really all that tired after singing Eugene Onegin. It's not like singing, I don't know, those really long... Verdi roles, it's not as exo- exhausting. This is nice. quite doable, you know. Let me change the subject for a sec. Um, sure. do you think music competitions are fair? Oh, great question. I mean, I was I was very lucky, I won eight of them. I was very lucky with that. Mm. And as far as fair, I mean, one of the reasons, and I would be first to admit it, the reason why I won eight of them is because four of them or something had the same jury. 
Mm. And I would be the first one to say, yeah, you, they liked me first time. And then, okay, they keep liking him. Mm. So, no, competition, you never compare apples to apples, oranges to oranges. You know, uh, if you are comparing only baritones, then I guess it's more fair. Or only tenors, only sopranos, only subred sopranos. You know, that's why subred sopranos never win competitions. It's always a dramatic, big dramatic voices. No, they, they don't do all that much. Competitions. I mean, it's good to do them once in a while, but also they're soul crushing. If you don't win. They are ego boosting if you do win. And no, I, I don't really think they are they have anything to do with reality. They are very helpful to young singers. I had a friend, Brent Ellis, this fabulous baritone, who mm -hmm. I think won I mean in the dozens of competitions when wow. he was younger. And it really launched his career forward. It's very helpful because I mean you get some money, you get some engagement, um, you get the representations. Yeah. For me, the best thing to win was young concert artists. I was mm -hmm. 25 years mm -hmm. old. I won young concert artists, and they managed me uh, four years or something, gave me 40 recitals around the country. You know? wow. That's that's the best thing that ever could have happened to anyone. Right. You know, it's mm -hmm. wonderful. I mean, you go from Alaska to Georgia to California to Maine, right. to all these recitals, and you really cut your teeth and really figure out how what works, what doesn't work. How to make a program that is effective, that's mm -hmm. uh, not exhausting. Yeah. Now, all those things it teaches you, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I'm really enjoying our conversation. It's a shame that you know, we have certain uh, time limitation, but um, I hope we we meet again and talk and podcast and not only. With you. Wonderful. Uh, what is your What is your PhD in? Um, well, my doctorate was. Um, Oh yeah, Ligeti. Ligeti is music and his evolution through his piano music because you know wow. it kind of mirrors adventures, you know, and what he else he did in the micropolyphony, you know, from his earliest, oh, wow. uh, uh, you know, earliest experiments through all the way through the 80s, and it, it, it's really fascinating. You know, I, I, Ligeti for, for me remains one of the most uh, enigmatic and interesting composers. You know, he just combines so many different influences from uh, sub Saharan polyphony. Um, to jazz, uh, to Lonious Monk, you know, to classical training, you know, it's just like very, very interesting, yeah. eclectic music. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, before we hang up, where were, when were you at Juilliard? I was at Juilliard from 2003 through 2011. I completed my master's and my doctorate. We were there for at least two years. We were there together. I was at JOC. Oh, wow. Well, well, so, yeah. yeah. Well, I was studying with uh, Mr. Loventhal, as we call him, J-Lo. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. Cool. And before that, I was in Paris Conservatory. I studied, you know, with Michel Berov and Denis Pascal. Amazing. Amazing. Um, anyway, um, so I just wanted to say, like, in your opinion, why music festivals are important? Why would you encourage young students, aspiring musicians, sign up for, say, Kirov International Music Festival? Why are these things important? Well, traditionally, music festivals are important because they provided performance opportunities. That's the most important thing that usually happened. That's why all the young singers always wanted to go to, to um, uh, various festivals. The most famous ones would be something like Santa Fe or uh, Central City Opera, uh, Wolf Trap, all these uh, companies You know that mostly did not use young artists they didn't give all that much training there. It was mostly for uh, people who accomplished certain level to go on stage and do it. But there's another function that a festival absolutely provides, and that is a different perspective, an additional perspective. And that is uh, training. Get out of your little niche of your school where you are at. Mm -hmm. Get out of your undergrad or grad where you are. Go get a different perspective. Study with somebody completely different. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not very good to get stuck in one little academic environment. That's why everybody sounds the same. We don't want everybody to sound the same. Right. And I tell you from my personal experience as a young artist, when I was in my 20s, going to all these young artist programs was absolutely life-changing. 
life changing. And the same thing is true, I know, for many musicians that we bring to my festival here. It's the same idea. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your input. And we're so lucky to have you. And I look thank forward you. to meeting you and um, hearing you teach and perform. Thank you. Someday, someday soon. Absolutely. And good luck tonight. Спасибо.